and welcome back. You've just tuned in to Women's Day AM. This morning, I am joined by sisters Nusrat, sister Hannah, and sister Sultana. So, alhamdulillah, glad to have you sisters back on the show, and glad to have you, especially Sultana, back on the show. Here. Yeah, we always have love you over. <laughs> alhamdulillah. So, mashallah, we've mentioned that you're a spoken word artist and a writer, yeah. and um, we basically, we wanted to know, how, what was the reception that you've gotten, especially from the men, in terms of how you use your voice? What's the, what's the sort of okay, reaction? Well, after the whole your voice is aura thing and I'm not singing so thank God for that thank God for everyone that I'm not singing but um, you know alhamdulillah really positive I have to say that in the activist kind of circles that I've been in um, Muslim men and non-Muslim men have been nothing but um, uh, chivalrous and honorable and uh, they're very supportive a lot of them are very supportive I've had one or two situations where you know it hasn't been too great but I generally found that people respond really really well to women um, in the spoken word field or writers because there's um, there's such a lack of kind of uh, cohesion with regards to that so there are lots of Muslim women writers out there especially from like you know the West but they don't seem to have kind of a unity um, uh, amongst them we don't get to see each other that much um, so generally speaking, it's been really positive. I have to say, mashallah, the barakallah, I haven't had any kind of really bad experiences. Alhamdulillah, because a lot of the time we hear a lot of negativity yes. that is aimed towards our sisters yes. who are out there and actually making themselves yes. heard. Uh, and especially yes. from within the community, you yes. would think, subhanAllah, you know, why are you not supporting your sisters? You do, so it's you very good yeah, to hear you that you You do have had... the odd troll who decides to kind of decide yeah, to stalk yeah. you on social media and then spout hate food towards you. But then, I mean, that, that's going to happen to anyone. To anybody. anyone, yeah. yeah so, so it's, it's Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we're going to be continuing with sort of leadership roles in women uh, and in the community alhamdulillah so without further ado let's get on with the discussion in her views Muslim women in leadership is something that arouses the interests of Muslim and non-Muslims alike, as many see the two as being mutually exclusive. This way of thinking is made even more present with the media portrayals of Muslim women as submissive, with her role only being confined to the home, a narrative perpetuated by the cultural understanding that some people have regarding the role of Muslim women. But is that the case, and what does Islam have to say regarding the role of leadership and Muslim women? Well, remember, this is a live discussion, so please do share your comments and questions on this topic. Topic. The number is on your screens now, or you can uh, tweet us at Islam Channel hashtag WAM15. So, Sister uh, Sultan, I'm going to come to you first. Um, when we refer to Muslim women and leadership, what do we actually mean by that? Okay, so it depends on the definition that you have of leadership. So, if we are taking a very narrow, uh, uh, narrow definition of leadership, as in ruling a nation, then you know we could give the hadith about how a woman, you know, no nation will prosper if a woman rules her. And I think that that definition is narrow, and it does doesn't take into consideration what the question is actually asking you. Mm -hmm. The question is asking you something far deeper and far more varied and wide. So when we talk about leadership, we would say that any position in a society or community over her, you know, uh, um, the people that she lives with, the people that she's surrounded by, where she is a figure, where people recognise her role in that community, where people recognise her worth in that community, where people, re people recognise what she does for the community, what she does for the society. And if we're talking about that definition of leadership, then that's the definition that I think most of us would yes. probably agree upon. And we would, it's something that it needs discussion, it needs um, a, a deep discussion, Discussion because we have such kind of, um, uh, uh, I think, fear, a restricted, view. restricted and fear to discuss this topic. Mm. Fear to almost ask the question that what can a Muslim woman become? Mm. What are, what is her potential? What are her talents? What does uh, what are the gifts that God has given her that she can kind of you know further and offer to the community? And that's something that we are kind of stuck in a particular place at even now, um, and we really struggle with. So that's you know that that's leadership is so int integral to that, and that's why it needs a discussion. I think because when people tend to think of leadership roles, they tend to think of maybe you know a head of state or something like that and they don't think that actually you know leadership can come from you know any sort of background any sort of aspect I mean sister Nusra would you like to elaborate on it, a little it's bit it's true the... Um, the definition of leadership has generally been something that has been very constricted because when we think of it we do think of head of state a senator a governor which actually even though that that is one of the that is um, an example of leadership it's not the only example mm -hmm. we find that leadership um, with regard to women or even generally anyone can even be in a position where you are a figure so whether you're at school and you are a prefect yeah. you 
have a duty to ensure that the needs of your fellow classmates are being met. At home, you are the older sibling. You have a duty to also ensure that your younger sibling is following your footsteps. You are a mother, particularly in the, in the changing structures of families that we have in the West. Even when you are a single parent, you have a duty to ensure that your child is being brought up in um, a proper way. And if you are a Muslim woman, you actually have to ensure that your child is being brought up in a proper way and in accordance with Islam and the deen being implemented. So we see that leadership comes in various forms and it's not just um, related to one. That's essentially it. Yeah, subhanAllah, because, you know, we, like you said, we're very restricted in the way that we view the term leadership and what that actually means. But, Sister Hannah, what examples do we have, you know, in, uh, of Muslim women, both historically and in and, and current day, of women in leadership roles? Yeah, I think taking that broader definition that we've been discussing of leadership, you find that Islamic history is, is, is littered with Muslim women who were leaders in their respective fields, leading political, economic and social initiatives. Obviously, the first one that comes to everybody's mind is Khadija radiallahu anha, you know, the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was a businesswoman who employed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and many other men to go and trade on her behalf and travel and carry out transactions. Um, we know of Aisha radiallahu anha, you know, who was you know, subhanAllah, one of the greatest scholars Islam has ever seen, um, taught, um, who taught men and women. Uh, Umm Amara um, and the Prophet's granddaughter, Zainab radiallahu anha, both of them were very proficient on the battlefield, um, you know, militarily, perhaps something that perhaps uh, is not always associated with uh, Muslim women directly. Um, we have Umar al-Darda, who was a prominent jurist. And even then, later on throughout Islamic history, you have Lubna of Cordoba. Um, she was a mathematician. She was responsible um, for the Royal Library as well. She was a secretary um, uh, in the, during the Umayyad Khilafah. Um, you have the wife, Zubayda, of uh, Harun al-Rashid, and, you know, she instigated many uh, water, uh, like, sort of infrastructure around Mecca, some of which still remains today. And even today, you know, if you just take a simple Google search to see Muslim women who are, you know, progressing in every field, uh, you know, in the world, but perhaps to a lesser degree than we've seen in the past due to the socio-economic conditions that many of them, especially in the Muslim world, live you know, under. You know, subhanAllah, you know, we hear of these examples that you've given and it's really wonderful examples. And the thing is, is that sometimes we look further back into our history and recognize that, yes, you know, we have women who've achieved so much, mm. but we don't actually look at the women that we have within a sort of the context of today and no, within our community yes. and appreciate what they do. Because, yeah. you know, we do have a lot of women who are doctors, nurses, lawyers, yeah. teachers so many Muslim women who are in so many you know in varying fields of mm -hmm. professions and yet we don't give them that due respect as well we don't see them as being leaders and as being pioneers of you know said fields mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of a shame that we don't give you know we don't look at them in the same way I mean sister Sultan I mean con yeah. discussing I, sort of our past and present yeah, I think there's a problem and the reason I think that that exists is because we like to glorify a time in the past but we like to you know relegate these women into the history books without really knowing the psychology of these women for you to go into any respective field whether it was these women whether it was all the other women thousands upon thousands of examples who were jurists thinkers polymaths I mean Lubna of Cordoba wasn't just a mathematician she was a polymath so she was excellent at everything there's a thinking that goes behind that there's a process there's a psychological process which means that you are given agency and space to pursue your dream to pursue your gift to pursue a talent to be the best version of yourself. Why do we not um, allow or praise or honour women now? Because we don't allow that psychological process to take place now. We don't allow women, we don't honour them, we don't let them to pursue their dream, we don't allow them to uh, honour their gifts and their talents. We, because again, I think the Islam that we've fallen into is an Islam of do's and don'ts. So we're not really interested in the process, the process that people have to go through. And I think for women, they go through a very suffocating uh, set of parameters upon which they can kind of practice Islam. And that doesn't just come from within Islam, but I think even just, you know, the, 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 our history and our culture and our politics that has happened to us has yeah. caused that yeah. to occur. We've lost, we've, we've lost that sense of uh, um, um, excellence that we yeah, have, yes. you know, that yeah. sincerity, that striving and working hard. And I think we've kind of lost the fact that it is part, uh, part and parcel of what Islam teaches right. is yeah. to be excellent in everything that right. you do. We don't yeah. see that nowadays. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to approach always education and striving and achievement as part of 
you know, implementing Islam and obligation, but also something that the Islamic system as a whole encourages in not just one aspect of life, but in multiple aspects of life. And it's because you see that lack of Islam on the various levels of society, not just in the private sphere, that people have lost that desire to do well for the sake of Islam, to do well to benefit society and to, you know, further Islam in the world. But even with the with the sense yeah. of even trying to please Allah, we've yeah. kind of forgotten that and we've kind of relegated pleasing Allah to just yeah. specific mm. acts of worship. Yeah, rather than encompassing actually, everything else. I, I would slightly disagree with Hannah. I think that if you look at the Muslim community and you look at Muslim women, they are actually impassioned to do the best that they can do because sometimes people who are the most vulnerable, like criminals in the jails, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, you work even harder to try and find who you are. So you will find women in the most difficult of circumstances striving and achieving things, mm. like these sisters in Gaza, you know, that, that they will work their utmost to kind of achieve the best that they can do in their respective fields, whatever they can do, because they realise the limits, but they also realise their own potential. And that, to me, is, you know, very, very hopeful. That shows a real sense that Muslim women are following in the footsteps of all these women that we talked about in yeah. the past. No, definitely. You know, and that, and that, that also shows that, psycho you know, emotionally, there's great levels of emotional intelligence mm out there in, 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 amongst Muslim women to do that under very difficult circumstances. Yeah, I think the Ummah 100% has the potential, but often then the broader discussion is often about the structures, whether in society or, or on the levels of uh, whatever field that they're going to go into, that always puts obstacles in their way for them to truly yeah. make progression in their careers. Um, and a lot of that comes down, whether it's from the government or from other cultural barriers, um, but definitely I would agree, yes, the Ummah does have the potential. I think just touching upon some of the points that have been made and it's, uh, sometimes you find that you know uh, women who want to excel women who have this passion to actually mm -hmm. pursue certain things in life that is sort of outside of their home yeah. life sometimes don't get the support that they need from mm -hmm. the community or from you know their immediate family or from the men in their lives and we find that you know some do hold the view that Muslim women are relegated to just looking after their homes and their families and why is it that we we find this why is it that we find people actually hold this view um, well, this view, like you said, is mentioned both within the Muslim community and outside, but I'll first tackle it with the Muslim community. Um, the Muslim community, why we sometimes think that women can't be leaders is because a lot of it tends to be ingrained in a type of misogyny, which is prevalent. We have to be honest about it. It yeah. does. Now, this misogyny takes place in two roots. One, it's, cult, um, it's conflation of culture with Islam. So the idea that women's aspirations should only be confined to the home. And if she does that, she's a bad woman or she's selfish. Yeah. And not understanding that actually you are following in the footsteps of women prior, of your um, women prior to you. You're just using Islam as a way to get into that. And because of that, the cycle of not wanting to strive for your best continues and we find women being locked in that glass ceiling of mm. you can only achieve so much. Um, and another is literalist interpretation of scriptural sources. Some people interpret some of the hadith in its literal sense to the point where it hinders you as a woman from progressing. Now this is a problem because essentially you are limiting someone's potential, untapped potential that could go on to do wonders and for not just the Muslim community but for the world all over. Um, within the non-Muslim society we also have the issue of ingrained Islamophobia and sexism and racism, which all have an intersection within them. Now, Islamophobia is, is all well and uh, truly there. We can't deny it. And accepting women as leaders we, is something we tolerate, not necessarily accept. Um, you know, yeah. subhanAllah, you know, these are really valid points, and I think this is something that we can definitely come back to, but we're going for a break, inshallah, and then Sister Nusra, you can go in depth a bit more okay. with, uh, with mm -hmm. the analysis that you've got. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I'm joined by Sister Nusrat, Sister Hannah and Sister Sultana to continue our discussion on Muslim women and leadership roles. And remember, if you have anything to add to this conversation, please do call in. The number is on your screens now. Or you can tweet us at Islam channel hashtag wham. So Nusrat, before we went on the break, um, you started talking to us about, you know, the, the different sort of reasons why you find people actually don't, don't feel that women can engage in leadership roles within the community and I think you kind of talked about the broader picture here. Yes, there is a broader picture. I mentioned about how whenever we um, see women as leaders we only tolerate it but not accept it and that's even within the wider society that we live in where we're just tolerating not accepting women as leaders. And now when you put an ethnic face, a hijab and an ethnic name into the mix it has this kind of passive aggressive backlash. How can she be a leader? And when we do see women of colour that are Muslim women being leaders, oh it's 
seen as some revolutionary act. She's going against her culture, which, no, effectively, she's just um, following um, uh, the examples of the Sahabiyat and other women who made a difference. Now, you're probably, you're probably going to wonder now, where does this thinking come from? It comes from a colonial mindset, really. This idea, and this glass ceiling, the idea that um, how can you, as a woman of color who is a Muslim, rule over me? The kind of white supremacist structure, essentially. How can you actually be a leader? I should be leading over you. Now, when you have all of these structures combined with the Islamic, um, combined with cultural attitudes um, such as literal interpretation and cultural conflation, you now have all these four obstacles working against you yeah. to be a leader. And you find in your bid to do that, while some people do succeed, a lot of people in the end end up falling by the wayside. Yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me when you said the sort of all these levels mm. of reasons of why you don't particularly, people don't want to acknowledge women who are mm. in leadership roles, especially if they are Muslim and covered. Mm. I think it goes against the narrative of what mm. people like to portray, especially when yeah. we look at sort of the media attention that Muslim gets. Yes. You know, it's mm. always, you know, the downtrodden, the poor, oppressed Muslim yeah. woman who's made to cover head to toe, who yeah. hasn't got a voice, is probably not educated. Yeah. And when you have women who actually go against that narrative, mm. no one wants to acknowledge that. Well, look, yeah. at, look, at, look at the media furore about Nadia from the Great British Bake Off. Boo Boo can bake. So, yeah, girl can bake. <laughs> and she's got a hijab on her head and she makes facial expressions. Wow. You know, so th there's this kind of kind of like dehumanizing of the Muslim woman so that when she is a figure, a personality of somebody and she can bake a cake, it's considered a huge big deal. And I think this just tells you exactly the kind of narrative we're in, the kind of p position we find ourselves in, mm. that we are dehumanized. We don't have a voice. I mean, if you're brown, forget it. Um, and if you can speak English, that doesn't happen either. So uh, the, all these reasons play into why we then um, you know, we're constantly up against that to be able to assert the fact that we, they make we do, it do seem do these as things. though They make it seem as though, like, even when they do say, acknowledge the person, like, say, Nadia, right. for example, they say, do you know what, it's because she's had the opportunity to grow up here. It's because, yeah. you know, uh, she's had the English education yeah. system, you know, yeah. uh, backing her, and she's yeah. had all of this, that, and the other. And the thing yeah. is, is that, while, wow, mashallah, she's, yes. she's, made, she's made an achievement yes. and she's taken a step forward to kind of, you know, shatter certain perceptions that people hold towards... Yeah. Um, Muslim women, yeah. she's not the exception. But, but she, there are yeah. many Muslim women but out there. What's interesting is, is whose perceptions are she, is she shuttering? Because she's not shuttering any of my perceptions or your perceptions. She's shuttering the perceptions of the same people who are going to report about her life like that, yeah? That she grew up in Luton and look at the school she went and all of this kind of stuff. She's shuttering their perception and it, it actually makes them feel slightly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They don't feel comfortable with that. For us, she's just a Muslim sister mm -hmm. who can yeah. bake a cake. Masha'Allah, she probably makes wonderful cakes. The point here is, is how do we advance that discussion? Where do we take that discussion? And I think that is the more um, challenging matter because from within our ranks, we sometimes, uh, unfortunately, as um, uh, Nusrat was saying, that the misogyny is the thing that holds us down. You know, they don't want us to advance because of their reading, literalist reading of Islam or what have you. Mm. They don't want us to do professions such as doctors or nurses, but then they're not gonna let your wife see a male gynecologist. You don't want a woman <laughs> to become a doctor or become educated, but you're not going to let a, a, a man examine your wife when she, you take her to the doctor. There's a bit of a problem here. So this is the problem that we find ourselves in. Um, and again, the first place is do we allow women to articulate the fact that they want to take these roles, that they want to do these things. It's not just about education, it's mm. even about motherhood. Mm. It's about all of those kind of fields that, you know, that they want to be um, kind of conscious parents. They want to do the best for their children. They want to have dreams and aspirations for their children and they want to kind of do that. And I think that this is the problem that we start with. Do we allow Muslim women to have voice as leaders? Can they speak in the voices of leadership? Mm. No. I think, I think it starts with, from within the home. Yes. I think you find that a lot of people who, mashallah, who excel, who happen to be Muslim, come from uh, families who are very, very supportive yes. of them, families who actually push them to do their best. And yes. sometimes that we find that sometimes, you know, people who have faced adversity from the community tend to be the strongest of people, and we don't tend yeah. to acknowledge that. Yeah. And, and subhanAllah, you know, we kind of take it as, like, the norm that if you want to be, you know, a housewife, alhamdulillah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But you find that some people feel that that's the only option yes. that they have because yes. the community will say well hold on why are you doing why would you want, to, why do would you want to do that yes. you know you've got a family to look after yes. you know it's a bit selfish of you to want yeah. to go out there and do other things you yeah. know look after your family yeah. I think you know they forget that you know while yes Muslim women we have our priorities that doesn't mean that that's the yeah. only thing that we can yeah. do but what does Islam actually say about Muslim women 
in mm. positions of leadership because we need to actually understand what mm. Islam has to say about this. I think it's clear, alhamdulillah, from the great discussion that we were having that, you know, Islam doesn't mm. put a limit no. on women working in whichever field that they choose, you know, as long as according to Islam, you know, it's fine and excelling in that and, and you know, achieving great things. But um, positions of ruling under an Islamic system, as Sister Sultana mentioned earlier with the hadith, they are limited to men. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a people who appoint a woman as their ruler, um, they will never be successful. And this is again in the sphere of political leadership and the definition of success is success in the akhirah. So it's not saying that it won't necessarily be a successful state physically in this world, but Allah will not necessarily be happy with it. The first point to make about this is uh, that Islam does not viewed the leadership the way that it is portrayed in this society and has been portrayed in previous civilizations it's not a gateway to fame and fortune it is a responsibility and one that we, you are judged very very harshly um, upon on the day of judgment um, positions of leadership governorship in Islam you're not allowed to ask for them you have to be nominated if you ask for it you're actually immediately excluded from the process so again this isn't something that you should be seeking out of your own nafs um, and then you have the examples you know of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba that followed after him um, um, as a khulafa, the delicacy that they treated this role, how poor that they remained for fear that they would have more than the people they were looking after, how they couldn't rest until the affairs of the ummah were actually settled. So it's showing you that, it, and this is, you know, in stark contrast mm. to how we've seen leadership in other civilizations, whether it's, mm. you know, the pharaohs, um, the royal families of Europe, and even today, you know, the prime ministers and the presidents with their five houses and luxury holidays, you know, Islam does not, uh, it, it doesn't attach this kind of lifestyle or prestige to rulership so for when we now look at the uh, the fact that women are not permitted to go into this area we don't view it as oh look this is such a disadvantage to them rather it's a burden that's been given to men that women have been exempt from um, and unfortunately sometimes though this argument is portrayed um, by many scholars talking about you know misogyny and cultural attitudes mm -hmm. and literalist interpretations of the scriptures mm -hmm. um, by many scholars especially those perhaps from Saudi Arabian ministries just a quick search on the internet will tell you they try and attribute this to you know women's lack of intelligence or the fact that they're supposedly you know weak in character um, but Islam encourages and you know it, it makes it an obligation upon women to be active in the political sphere in various other roles. Um, it's a much greater discuss discussion than can be covered today, but it's important. To the, the, this, thing, this argument is used a lot in the media, so it's important that we as Muslim women know the reality behind it in order to explain. You know, Subhanallah, it. it's, it's one of those things that we attach certain sort of uh, feelings towards certain roles, and we don't actually tend to, like you said, it's a massive undertaking, a massive responsibility that Allah has kind of saved us from, and we should think, you know. Alhamdulillah, I don't have to do something as big as this. And we know that Umar bin al-Khattab, he used to walk around looking for people to make sure that no one's going without because he was so in fear of what he would have to account for in the Day of Judgment. So I think, Alhamdulillah. But what message can we, you know, or advice or tips can we give to young women and girls who are watching today who actually want to take an active uh, role in doing things that maybe a lot of people might feel uncomfortable with, Sister Sultana? I think the first thing is to actually have those discussions as to why these uh, why it, we feel so uncomfortable with it where does the root of that lay and if the root of that lays in literalist interpretations of Islam or a reading of Islam which is constrained um, then we need to root that out and we need to kind of unpack it and we need to explode those myths because until we do that um, actions are just actions and they can happen they might not happen but the point here is is we need to bring a kind of um, revolutionary change in terms of the way that we think about the topic um, and that's the place that you start. I watched a program, um, a short clip on Al Jazeera of this young lady who was from a village in Pakistan and she basically decided to become the first female firefighter in her village and Shazia her name is good one Shazia um, and then they filmed her family and her family are from a village in Pakistan and they filmed her parents and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them because it was that it was the the kind of support of her parents who had obviously thought consciously about this they'd consciously thought of that decision so is education always the uh, you know the marker of whether or not you can have these discussions no it's just to do with whether or not we're truthful about what women can and can't achieve and I think and if we were really honest with ourselves what is the fear 
fear that we have if women achieve these things in our societies? What is the fear? Why do we attach so much fear to that? Because we attach fear because we are reacting to the liberal standard of, oh, if we allow our women to do these things, they're going to run amok. Yeah. yeah? And that's where it, in essence, comes it's, from. Uh, that's absolutely true, and I yeah. agree with you there. And yeah. alhamdulillah, we have a caller on the line. We have Sister Tabassum on the line. Salaam alaikum, Sister. Walaikum salam, Sister. I just wanted to say women will find setbacks, obstacles, challenges, and uh, all around the world um, and be actively um, oppressed at times. And ethnic minor minority women can uh, more or less, you know, timetable that in and expect it. The focus is to be, you know, focus on being the best at what you do, excelling at it, and being very strong and seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, seeking support from like minded sisters. Mm -hmm. And sometimes communities will let you down too. Uh, but don't let that dishearten you. I think, mashallah, the sister's got a really positive message yeah, there. Yeah. Excel in what you're doing. Yeah. Surround yourself with people who support you and yeah. kind of ignore that negativity. She said something very in important. She said like-minded people. Subhanallah. That's Absolutely. Very important. Absolutely. Very important. Well, well, against the spirit either. Yes. Exactly. Jazakallah khair for that, sisters. While some Muslims may still adhere to the cultural understanding of the role of women in positions of leadership, Islam has given a woman honor in ensuring that in whatever she does, she assumes her position in a way that doesn't compromise her Islam beliefs but also allows her to excel under the banner of Islam. It's been a really informative discussion but if you've missed any of it today's show you can catch a repeat tonight at 11 p.m. or you can catch up with the highlights from this week at Sunday 3 p.m. Shall I will, we'll, we'll leave you with that but do stay tuned as after the break we'll be back with our third segment. Asalaamu Alaikum.